I went to college as a Negro and came out as a black. I've heard people erroneously state, we did all that protesting in the 60s and nothing came of it. That's not true. I entered college in 1968. In 1968, Martin Luther King was assassinated. Robert Kennedy was assassinated. So it was an awakening. Activism was rampant. Protests do a great job of energizing folks. It does a great job of educating folks. But then you've got to translate that into some tangible action. What tangible actions? Leadership positions, community action, political positions. What is part of the avenue for that? You got to vote. First step of voting, you got to be registered. It's amazing to this day that after how long and how hard it was to get voting rights for everyone, that there's still so many people who don't exercise that right. Your vote counts. Your vote counts. We can protest, we can shout, but if we don't vote, we won't expect change. Vote. Every vote counts. Register? Thumbs up. Thumbs up if you register. I celebrated my 50th anniversary with Omega Psi Phi fraternity. Grand folk, 44 young men entered into Omega Psi Phi on April 9th, 1970 at 9.30 p.m. Grand Funk Railroad, the largest pledge class ever at Morgan State University. We were called Grand Funk because when we crossed the bridge, we looked like a train. Because if you can imagine, 44 Omega men stepping and marching across the bridge. Probably not a two-week period goes by that I don't have some communication from uh, one of the brothers on my line. There are four cardinal principles, manhood, scholarship, perseverance, and uplift. That's something I want to be associated with. I want to take those principles and mold my life around those things. But when I look at my classmates, the doctors, the lawyers, the college professors, the department heads, the head of Fannie Mae, general officers, current five colonels, and I'm just talking about Grand Funk again. Those titles I just gave you are titles of individuals who were off of Grand Funk. And we were just a cross section of good college kids. Uh, and upon graduation, I was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the United States Army. Uh, I was fortunate to get an RA commission, regular army. The only way you get an RA commission is you graduate from one of the service academies or you're top 5% of all ROTC cadets. I was an infantry officer. I spent several years in the mechanized infantry. I went to airborne school, ranger school, and I went to flight school. I was a uh, Cobra gunship pilot. Uh, so I'm very proud of my military service. Now the military, I knew as a military officer, you could not and you did not express any political beliefs while in uniform. Certain groups, certain organizations have created a false narrative that the military or the police or other organizations are leaning in one direction. You gotta remember, they're a cross section of who we are and you swear when you go into the military, and I think a lot of people get this wrong, there is only one thing that you swear to uphold. That's the Constitution of the United States. You don't swear to protect the flag. You don't swear to do uh, protect any policy. And I swore to uphold the Constitution of the United States. We were always on an island. Unfortunately, my generation, there were too many of us who could say, I'm the first, or I'm the only, or I'm one of two. Hopefully, your generation and the next generations, you won't be using those kinds of words. Unfortunately, there are still some doing it, but it's uh, to a much lesser degree than my generation did. Golf became a hobby and a passion. I was able to retire early from corporate America, and I was in a position 
to pursue other things. But it became a way to combine a passion with the desire to have a business. At the time, I was one of four African Americans to own a golf course. Just sitting in my office, and I had my pro, he was behind the register, and he had a white individual walk in and ask him, is it true that a black man bought this golf course? He said, yeah. So he owns it now? He said, yes. Yeah. The guy looked my pro in the eye and said, I'll never be back, and walked out. I wanted you guys to be comfortable making a presentation in the boardroom, but then being able to walk down the street and seeing a homeless person and being just as comfortable speaking to that person and understanding how and why they might be in that circumstance and then not turning up your nose that, oh my God, look at that. We had to talk <laughs> with our kids. 20 years ago, 30 years ago, I was telling my young son how he should behave if he was stopped by the police. I told his young friends, I told my daughter, I told you, I just, I told them, this is how you act, this is why you act that way. You're going to be perceived differently in a lot of circumstances. That was 30 years ago. Last month, we have five Omega Brothers who are police officers. They conducted what was supposed to be a one-hour session on dealing with the police. This session took over three hours, not because no one was understanding, it's because the young men were so intrigued and engrossed in the subject matter. Individual being stopped by the police, you don't know what happened 10 minutes before that may have that police officer on edge. You don't know what has happened last week with that police officer. And this is where I think uh, black males really need to think about. Why is it that so many non-minority officers immediately view black youth as threatening? Just like there is a minority of officers who we see as bad apples, there is an image, true or not true, that white America has of young African Americans. One thing about the military, uh, when you're dealing with uh, a wartime situation, know your enemy, study your enemy, know how he thinks, know how he fights. You have a picture in mind. And if we have been portrayed, if our young men have been, been portrayed as the enemy, how does it affect the average police officer? Then you deal with that small percentage that are on the edge of what we call bad cops. It just justifies in their mind their actions. So yes, we got to deal with the bad cops. And we got to deal swiftly and quickly with those. But at the same time, we got to deal with things that are going on in society, how we're portrayed, why we're portrayed that way. When you walk into a room, there is one thing that everybody in that room knows about you. You guys know what that is. And I would ask, and somebody said, oh, where I'm from, or what I'm wearing. I said, no, they know that you're black. Now you have an opportunity. You can open your mouth or demonstrate by your behavior and prove every misconception they have about you to be entirely correct. Or you have the opportunity to open your mouth and behave in such a way to just send them home wondering, what did I just see? Is that the real world or is this an anomaly? They will try to play it off as an anomaly, but when they start seeing that that is the real world, then those perceptions start to change. That becomes their new reality. The thought crossed my mind. Would this had come about sooner if the slogan had been Black Lives Matter too? So the, the switch couldn't be flipped that, oh, Black Lives Matter. Oh, they're saying white lives don't matter. They're saying blue lives don't matter. No, it was never said. That was not said. I never interpreted it that way, but it was easy for a political agenda to flip the script and say, oh, did you hear what they said? They said Black Lives Matter. Did you hear the code in that? The intent as people see it today, Black Lives Matter also. Black Lives Matter too. 
all lives matter. Yes, all lives matter. Black, white, Asian, blue, military, all lives matter. How is it that the person who's being called out can dictate to you how you should protest? Because the whole thing about protests is I've got to make you feel uncomfortable or it's not effective protest. When uh, Dr. King was protesting, they didn't want him to march down Main Street in front of the stores. They didn't want him to march on Sundays. They didn't want him to march with young people in the crowd. Those are some of the things that made his protest effective because it made the oppressor uncomfortable. So if I can't make you uncomfortable with my peaceful protests, it, why protest? You know, when I was growing up, I had a lot of family and community around me that used to uh, tell me, boy, you're smart. You're, you're going places, you're gonna do that. And you know what? I was just dumb enough to believe them. It was a community that motivated me and uplifted me to believe that I could do anything that I wanted to do if I put the time and effort into doing it. You know, I'm standing on the shoulders of a lot of folks to get to where I am. And I would just like to make sure that what I have seen is given to you so that you in turn may benefit from it and you in turn may be able to pass it on to someone else. Did that work? Yeah.